bring joy. Repeat, repeat the sounding joy. He rules, he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations through. The glories of his righteousness of his love and wonders of his love and wonders wonders of his love joy to the world the Lord is come and receive a king let every heart prepare him
open my eyes to your wonders anew. You're catching my heart with this love. There's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you. Yeah. You open my eyes, you want us to do. You catch in my heart with this love. There's nothing on earth is as beautiful as you.
curse for my freedom, pain for my peace, for suffering and anguish that brought my release. I'm grateful. I am grateful for this reason.
He makes me like Alvin Green and
before us and all the will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name's the highest, your name's the greatest, your name stands above them all. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name
then put the title of our message up, which is the shepherds. Of course, every year I end up talking about shepherds and wise men and the birth of Jesus. On our Thursday nights, we've been making our way through the story of Mary bringing Jesus to earth, following that analogy of us being like Mary and the fact that we need to channel what is in eternity into earth to become a reality. The word became flesh and it dwelt among us. We saw his glory here. God needed a person through which to do that. He needed Mary. And of course it's analogous to the fact that God has great strategies and plans for us and he wants to do those things through us. And in fact he does not circumvent us. He does not circumnavigate us. He uses us, and thank God for that. How many of you are happy the Lord wants to use you? The Lord wants the Spirit to come upon you and for you to be found with child, burdened or impregnated with, the God, with God's purpose in his plan since before the foundation of the world, he wanted to put that plan in you and then cause you to be able to live it. And... All of us are being used at different times to do different things. Here we're going to look tonight at the shepherds finding Jesus. As you know, this time of year, everybody's celebrating Christmas. It's a great time. I enjoy it. And I enjoy the foods. I enjoy the fellowship. I enjoy the connection with people. Uh, I wish there were more Christmas decorations here in Singapore than there are. The malls are kind of scarce this year. I don't know if you notice, it's not as much as I've seen in the past, but I do enjoy it. So being at the birth of Jesus was the beginning of the salvation of man. It's, it was very important that God mark that moment, that he make it clear, that he confirm it, and that people be witness to the birth of Jesus. And that's what the shepherds were chosen to do. So I want to start by reading Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. It says, In those days... Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. There, were, there was no lodging. The whole city was booked up. And so they found a space in a barn and a place where animals were kept and this feeding trough would just have to make do. And so they wrapped the baby in some type of cloth and put him, linen cloth, and then put him in this manger, which I'm sure when they did this, they were not thinking or following an exact design of what God told them to do. They were simply trying to keep newborn baby Jesus warm and safe and protected in a safe place, and the manger is the only place available at the time. So they did this, but they're, they're, it's very important that this thing that they thought they just, just guessed doing was a big part of a sign to the shepherds to be able to see and recognize who Messiah was. And some of the things we even guess in life, some of the choices we make that just seem like an idea we have in the moment, we have to understand that God's plan is so big and so vast that even your mistakes can be exactly what God needs from you. Even your problems, even your issues, whatever, even the things that are hard times, difficult times, your moments of suffering. I'm sure that Joseph and Mary were not happy to not find proper lodging. I'm sure they were not thrilled and happy about having to sleep in a barn with animals and put their newborn baby in such, such an unclean environment. Imagine the, the ground was covered with manure. There. It had to not smell nice in there. And this was a stable or a place where animals were kept. But they did this because God had 
a specific plan to reveal that image to these shepherds, which I find fascinating. So the Lord's birth here, it impacted so many people. At the very time that Jesus was coming, all the people around him, of course, had, they went through changes. We know Zechariah and Elizabeth, they went through some amazing encounters. Zechariah did in the temple. And all that was connected for John the Baptist to be able to be born and filled with the Spirit before he was born so that he would be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord. John the Baptist was chosen to prepare. So his life, Zachariah's life, Elizabeth's life, all of these are, are like masses that are rotating around the life of Jesus. Jesus is the center of all things. Jesus is the center of the universe. Jesus is the center of the Holy of Holies. He's the center of New Jerusalem. He is the center of our lives. He has to be the most central theme, most central part of our existence. Uh, Mary and Joseph, of course, they were just satellites around Jesus. They were being used so that Jesus could come here to earth, that Jesus could be safe, protected. This past week, we're studying how how Joseph became the real helper and protector. He went from wanting to reject Mary entirely to a place of protecting, guarding, and keeping safe, and being the one in touch with God through dreams and visions to protect and guard baby Jesus. Mary yielded and did her part, but they were working together as a team. Uh, the astrologers or the magi that we're not looking at tonight they were impacted. Their lives were turned upside down, all to be able to follow this star to mark and, and recognize these, these men, recognize Jesus. All this, everything revolves around Jesus. Everything in your life should be revolving around Jesus. Every choice you make, every decision that you take in this life, it should be in an orbit around Jesus around his, his glorious presence in your life. Everything you think, every action, every morning you wake up, your life should be lived as, as, a, 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 as I say, in orbit to Jesus. Jesus has to be the absolute center. And of course, these shepherds that we're seeing tonight also, they, their lives were changed dramatically all because of this little Jesus, the king, King Herod. His life was disturbed, upset, he was angry, he was afraid that this Jesus born would be the king that would take his place, so he put a death sentence on him. All these people, all these people, so there's good people and there's bad people surrounding Jesus, but everything, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. You either confess here on earth and have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, or you do not confess here on earth, you're still going to be forced to confess in eternity, but your name will not be in the Lamb's Book of Life. You will go to the lake of fire. So we, everyone's going to confess. Everyone is going to come into that orbit around Jesus. And he is the absolute master. He's the king of every king. He's the Lord of every Lord. And he's born here on earth. And these shepherds, we're going to look at them tonight because I, I want to examine how the birth of Jesus affected these shepherds because I think it's an analogy that we can use to consider how the birth of Jesus affects us, how we are altered. And so we're going to identify with the shepherds and see four things we share with the shepherds. These are four things you share with these shepherds, likenesses, similarities between our lives and the lives of the shepherds. And this is, of course, a, a devotional view of this. And God gave me some ideas to share. This is a yearly theme. I do it every year, but every year something new comes out of it and God speaks. And so today, as I was meditating and preparing for this, God spoke to me some specific things that I want to share in line with these four things we share with the shepherds. Amen. How many of you want to examine these shepherds with me? See these similarities? and learn from God's word. You want to do that? So you will accept what I have to preach tonight, amen? You will, you agree, then we are in agreement. There's a covenant in the room. You agree that I will speak and you will receive those words. Then in that case, the, the anointing is released. God's power is released for that energy to move to you. That's why two or more gathered in one place. If we're in agreement, God will do great things. So let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that your word is alive 
sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce, able to penetrate us and to divide, to pierce asunder, that is to, to divide joints and marrow and in fact go in and divide the spirit and the soul and our humanity. It is a discerner. Your word is a discerner of the thoughts, the intents, the designs and desires of our own human hearts. In other words, as we read your word and allow it to go deep into us as this double-edged sword, we know that you're going to expose things in us, reveal things to us. So we come hungry to feed on your word and have this word give us life because we have come to recognize and accept the, the unavoidable fact that this word is the only eternal thing we have. That the words of men... The opinions of men are worthless in comparison. This is life. This is the value of our existence. These words, heaven and earth will pass away, but these words, if we ingest them tonight, if we bring them into our blood, if we bring them into our conscience, if we bring them into our bodies, we are infesting ourselves with eternity. We are putting eternity into us. It has to have great effect, Lord. It has to change us. Your word sanctifies us. You said, Jesus, when praying to the Father in the 17th chapter of John, that I have given them your word, Father. I've given them your word and it has sanctified them. Lord, that's what we're looking for tonight. We want your word to sanctify us. We want your word to purify us. Wash us in the water of the word. Let it be alive in us and through us. Lord, we accept your word and we call it God's holy word, infallible and perfect. And we ask for your blessings on the reading and the hearing of these words. In Jesus' name, we're all in agreement. So therefore we say, Amen. 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 Four things we share with the shepherds. Number one, the shepherds were ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary task. They were ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary, an extraordinary task. Like connected to the word natural versus supernatural. Natural is what you see and can feel and touch. I naturally can walk through this room. If I were to levitate and float through this room, that would be supernatural. So the thing is that God is calling us into a realm of supernatural things. Supernatural connection, spiritual connection, breaking away from the flesh. But what he does is he uses just people like me and you, ordinary people. And verse 8 of chapter 2 of Luke, it says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. So, so we see here these, these are simple working shepherds no, with no expectations. I don't think they were out in the wilderness taking care of their sheep through the night, protecting them. If anything, they were more concerned about wolves and lions and tigers and bears. They were more concerned about thieves, more concerned about someone coming to take their sheep. So they were vigilant through the night. They were doing their job. That's their job, keep these animals alive until they would get to the point of shearing or get to the point of sale. This was commerce. And so they were working their jobs. They were just minding their own business for, for whatever reason. God chose these shepherds, these ordinary shepherds, in the middle of the fields surrounding Bethlehem to be witnesses of the birth of Jesus. Now, Jesus was not born in the fields. Jesus is born and placed in a manger. But these shepherds are not where that manger is. They're not in the city. They're outside the city working in the fields. So God does that. He calls people from one realm to another to meet Jesus. He calls them from one world, one culture, one understanding, one function, and brings them out away from it to another place where they will meet Jesus. You rarely will you meet Jesus where you naturally exist. You have to be brought somewhere else. Moses was brought to the burning bush. Um, these different people brought to different places, but these guys, they're out there. Many of us, like these shepherds, did not expect God to do what he's done in our life. A lot of us did not have expectations from the time we were very young that God would reveal himself to us. And 
He is the God of the suddenlies. Often these changes came about in our life without warning. All of a sudden, an epiphany or an idea, some revelation came or you heard some word in season and that word impacted you and it changed you. We can all reflect on times when we were just being ordinary and living our lives and God interrupted us. God, God is about to seriously interrupt these shepherds in this story. And it is my heart's prayer that God interrupt everybody's life. It, it is my, my petition as a missionary through the years working in different regions that God come into the lives of the ordinary people and disrupt that life, shake that life, challenge that individual because it's the only way they would be able to come to see Jesus and believe in him. And these shepherds right now, they don't believe in Jesus. They don't know anything about Jesus. I doubt that they are biblical scholars meditating on the messianic prophecies out there in the middle of the wilderness. No, they're just watching their sheep, ordinary people. God has a plan to use them, though. And God has a plan to use you. He has a plan to use me. He finds us in our obscurity and he separates us and uses. Remember that God is never in the entertainment business. Anything he ever does to reveal himself to you, it's for a great purpose. And he has a purpose for us all. He always has a practical plan to employ us, to use us. And to me, that's a great honor that he would want to use us. When Gabriel went to Mary to tell her that she would have a child and she would name him Jesus and, she, and the Spirit would come upon her, she really had trouble accepting that because she was just an ordinary person. In fact, not equipped, not, how can I, a virgin, give birth to a child? She had not had any relationships with a man she biologically knew about the facts of humanity. She was not, she was not able to have a child in her state, but she decided to do what? Submit to the words of God. And she said, here I am, whatever. I am your bond servant. I submit to you. So we see this. Shepherds here, ordinary people have choices to submit or not submit to the interruptions of God, as do all of us. This, we have this in common with these shepherds. God may try to come to do something in our life, but we have a choice to say no. We have a choice to reflect or to reject his influence or his incursion in our life. And a lot of people do this. Many are called, few are chosen. Many are called to do great things. In other words, God's purpose is all that matters to God. And he saves you, he delivers you, separates you, and he works everything out for the good of those who are called and are fulfilling his purposes. He's trying to do that, but we have a choice. We have a decision to make. Moses had a, a choice. I like Moses in, when I compare him in the story because he too was a shepherd out in the field taking care of his animals when God interrupted his life. How many times do you think Moses looked back during the hard moments when he was confronting Pharaoh and watching the plagues and dealing with that? How many times do you think Moses looked back when he was already in the wilderness with the hard-headed, stiff-necked, stubborn Israelites that were constantly uh, wrestling with the purposes of God? How many times did Moses... Look back and say, I wish I would have never gone over to that bush. If I had just ignored that bush and didn't, didn't go see it, I would have never heard the voice. But the fact is, he did go over, he did hear it, and God had a purpose and, and revealed it to him. And we're all the same. There's a passage of scripture as I'm looking at the fact that the shepherds were ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary task like us. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him 
that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we're not many of us when God finds us as ordinary people. Not many of us are wise by human standards, it says. Not many of us are influential. These days we live in a world of influencers. You have people who have opinions, and that opinion and people listening to that opinion is now monetized. And when I watch YouTube or TikTok or these different influencers are speaking, it is amazing to me the amount of wealth that they can accrue just because they're influenced, just their opinion. And of course, some of them have really bad attitudes. Some of them use that power of influence to manipulate people. But the best influencers know that's not the goal. We are not, I don't know how many people are looking at your YouTube channels. I, I have a YouTube channel. I go through it sometimes and say, let's see if somebody's watching my videos. I have videos on my YouTube channel that have only been viewed two times. Not many influential. I am not an influencer. I am, there's, nobody's like, there's not hundreds of thousands of views on the things that I put out there. I'm just me doing what I'm doing, but God uses me. Not, not many high-born, he says here, not many of noble birth. How many of you are royalty here tonight? In your bloodline, you can prove. My father once told me that we are, that, that my family, I don't believe it, and, uh, but he once said that they did some DNA thing and he discovered that we are actually the lineage of royalty from European and the European nations and he somehow proved it and at the end of this whole discourse to me about son your royalty I said to him and so what can I do with that what, what does that give me if even if I am and I can prove this it's worthless and so I don't we don't need these things Paul is telling the church in Corinth and the shepherds were like that ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary task. God, God delights in taking the nothing. A lot of people do not like this passage when it says the foolish things because you don't want to identify with being foolish. You feel pretty good about yourself. You, you, you don't want a bad reputation, but I am happy to raise my hand when they ask how many fools are in the room tonight. I will raise my hand and say, I'm foolish. I have made a lot of mistakes. I've done a lot of stupid things. I will admit it right away. I, 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 I have a degree of intellect, but in the light of Almighty God, I am absolutely the foolish thing that he would choose. And I just submit to him. And I have a, I have a choice like the shepherds do. But he takes us and chooses us. He calls us, not because we're something special, but because he wants to transform us into someone that does his purpose. So your value is, is not built in what you are inherently, but it's built into your value in eternity is built into your obedience to his purpose. It comes down to that very simply. You can do everything you want to do for yourself. You can, you can achieve great and wonderful things. You can be very successful in business. You can become very wealthy and do all the things that you do on earth without necessarily doing the purpose of God. And that's so simple for me to just find what is it God, what is God wanting you to do? Just do that. And if you do that, even if it's, it's not very influential and not very important, if it's not very glittery or not very glorious, you're still getting eternity. In fact, you get a better, a better reward in eternity for simple obedience without recognition. And there, there are often times where, where God, I will do things, work hard for things, and other people take the credit. I like doing it. We were talking about that this last week. That is how I know God is in control. Uh, it's, Paul also spoke often about this idea. But he takes and he uses us and he transforms us. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, 
but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. That's his purpose. That's his plan for your life. It's good. It's pleasing to him. God is pleased with the work of his hands. It says when he created everything, he sat back and the Lord said and saw that it was good. Because God is good at doing God things. And when he made everything, he did it right. You look at anything in creation, and it's absolutely... You can pick up a bird's feather and look at it carefully, and you realize how great God is. That his creation is amazing. He does things, he does them well. But yet he made us with the ability to choose. He made us with the ability to, to say no. He gave us the right to refuse cooperation with his purpose. And we need to... That's why Paul is saying to the Romans, I urge you, he's saying, please, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, because God has been merciful to you, why don't you just offer yourself over to him? Why don't you just give him your body as a living sacrifice? Because that's holy and pleasing. And, and that's really what real worship is, he's telling them. That's true worship. Don't, don't do what the world tells you to do. Don't do what the world tells and its patterns and its protocols and its educational processes tell you to do. There's an image the world gives us and Paul is saying to the Romans, don't conform to those patterns. But be transformed, changed, metamorphosized. That's that word metamorphosized in the Greek. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? We prayed about it a moment ago before we started this study. By the word of God. Our minds are renewed by the word of God. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. You want to know the will of God for your life? The only place you're going to find it is through the word of God. Through meditation on the scriptures. Through studying the scriptures. And then you'll be able to prove his will. You'll find out his will and then you will see it done through you. And you don't have to be special to do this. You just need to be like these shepherds. When he finds you. When he finds you, you have a choice. And uh, these, with these shepherds we see, we have this in common with them. We are what we are, and that's not much. God comes to us, has a plan to reveal things to us about Jesus and his purpose for us uh, to serve his kingdom in some way. And we desperately need to find how can we serve the kingdom, big or small. If there's something he's expecting for you to do, even if it is tiny, even if it only requires a minute of your day each day, you get an equal reward. His purpose sometimes is not very big. It's very simple. Very simple. In the past, I worked with my relatives in automotive repair. And it always amazed me when we would dismantle an engine and pull apart the manifold and open up the carburetor and there, there were pieces inside that were so tiny, little tiny, tiny pieces. And without that piece, that car cannot operate. A little tiny thing. Sometimes some people are chosen by God to just give one little thing, one little thing. And he will reward you through eternity for that one. If you just do that one little thing. Some people miss God's purpose for their life because they're wanting it to be more. Sometimes, it's, that's why he says, I'm not looking for sacrifice. I'm looking for obedience. <laughs> Just do this one thing and, and you will be blessed forever. Do that one thing. Sometimes we find that one thing. I know my purpose. I fulfill my purpose and more every single day of my life. And I'm content. I can smile. When I wake up, I'm smiling. When I go to sleep, I'm smiling. I often awaken myself in the night laughing. That's how happy I am. And the reason is, is because I have done what the scripture says. I know and have, have worshipped the Lord by not being conformed to this world, but obeying his truths, following them and just doing one simple thing. For me, it's what I'm doing right now. If I can just preach, if I can just take, prepare messages and preach them, that is that one part that God is, yes, you did your job. You did your job. Of course, I do a lot more than that. 
And I do a lot to facilitate other people doing the same. And I work very hard. Actually, the vast majority of my time these days has been consumed with the upkeep, maintenance, and encouraging of missionaries. But that's always been my purpose too. That is, that is my call, is to, is to train them, send them, and then help them and educate them. And then let them go when they are independent enough. Let them go. But uh, that is my purpose. If that's what you need to know is, is the purpose. God's will. We need to be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And we have a choice. Amen. So the shepherds were ordinary people chosen for an ordinary task. You are ordinary people. It's not an insult. But you would not be in this room <laughs> if you were a very special, special person. You know what I mean. There's no Elon Musk's sitting in here. There's no Bill Gates in here. I prefer your company, by the way, and I love all of you and value you just as you are because God calls you and God is using you. And it's okay to be ordinary because God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. He wants to do miracles for you. The second thing we have in common with these shepherds is that the shepherds had an encounter with God that changed them forever. Verse 9 of Luke chapter 2, the story goes on. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Um, I bet they could have traveled all over um, Bethlehem and looked in every manger, and there was only one baby in a manger in the entire. I don't think it was a custom then to put babies in mangers in barns in the middle of the night. So that's why this was a unique sign for them. So they're hearing this information. God's giving them this key to a door of finding Jesus. This is how I will make sure that you will. This is such a unique thing they're going to witness. It's not unique to us because we have nativity scenes. And we've grown up our whole lives looking at little pictures of little Jesuses in mangers and so. But think about how strange it is. It, think of it like if God said, this is how you will know that it's Jesus. He will be inside of a microwave. And that's weird, right? Why would he be inside? You will find the baby inside of a microwave. It's not on, but he's just inside the microwave because it's a safe place to keep him. It'd be that bizarre. It's so strange, such a specific, odd thing. And, and I, I have often recognized the will of God by its visual absurdity. Like it's so obviously a God. My wife was telling me a story about a friend of hers today who for 20 years has not been in the workplace. And she now is returning to the workplace as a professional, a very educated woman. And she's basically been home and her husband work and she's taking care of the kids. But now she's getting back into the workforce and she's a good friend of Barbara's and she does not have um, clothes. As you know, those of you who work in the business world, there is certain clothing you have to have to work in certain. Well, she does not have that. And so she's been a little concerned about it. Another friend of Barbara's out of nowhere brought up something and asked Barbara, does your friend have work clothes? And one thing led to another. This woman is going to fill this other woman's closet with high-end working attire. Stuff that would cost thousands and thousands of dollars if you go out and get these beautiful suits and for this workplace. That's how you know. But the absurdity that somebody would randomly bring up a question about someone who maybe could use work clothes. And Barbara tells the story better than me. But that's today when she said that, I said, see, that that's God. That's how you know God is doing yeah. a thing. Yeah. Because it's a baby in a manger. Nobody puts a baby in a manger. You don't find babies in manger. God provides things and does things through avenues that you could never predict. Yeah. And he doesn't repeat it either. There was not more. It didn't become a trend 
Let every prophet now had to put their babies in mangers for them to come under the anointing. If you want an anointed baby, put it in a manger and then you know God will... Put... No, they didn't use it. I don't know, some religious groups might do that. I wouldn't put it past some of the religious. But here they have an encounter with God and they've been given this key, this absurd key to be able to make sure they don't get the wrong guy so they can connect with Jesus. God wants to connect you with his son, Jesus, and he's going to do so through some very unorthodox means. Now his, his will will be revealed to you in ways that you, what? The will will almost accidentally take place in your life. We're out there, they're hearing this now, and suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So we have to imagine really what's going on here with these guys. They, 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 what it must have been like in the dark at night, in the wilderness, looking for wolves, listening for every sound. Suddenly one angel just shows up. Hey, just boom. That alone scared them. And he's telling them, oh, I got good news for you guys. This is great. It's going to cause a lot of joy, great joy for all the people. I'm sure they're looking at him like, what are you even doing out here in the middle of the wilderness? Today, this is the good news. Today in a town, the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Our Savior, born to us? Yes, he's the Messiah. You've heard of the Messiah. This is the one. And that's a big statement. Big statement because all Jews were waiting for Messiah. Which, by the way, they still are. All Jews still today are waiting for Messiah. And they do not think it's Jesus. The Jews who are Orthodox Jews today, there are some Jews for Jesus, as they call them, that believe in Jesus and they still live also by Jewish traditions. That's fine. Um, that's okay. But most Jews, if you ask them to believe in Jesus, they refuse. It's, it is anathema to them. It is blasphemous to think that a man could be God on earth. So they totally reject it. They they may think that he could have been a prophet that maybe the people exploited and exaggerated about. And so they have ideas, but they're still waiting for a Savior. And what's going to blow their mind is when they do meet the Savior that is coming. According to the prophecies, of course, the, all the nations of the world are going to turn on Israel and they're going to surround Israel to destroy it. Uh, we might be right now forming the recipe to make that happen with what's going on there right now. It, Israel is is relentlessly pursuing Hamas, and they are at this point being accused of breaking a lot of rules and laws. And uh, my president, the president of the United States of America, he basically says, you know what, they have a right, after what was done to them, they have a right to do what they need to do. And, but there's a lot of pressure on my president, and a lot of pressure from the UN and from all these groups to tell Israel to stop using such heavy-handed response but if you really carefully look, they're doing exactly what they need to do to root out this evil, to get rid of it. They're pumping thousands, hundreds of thousands of gallons of salt water into the tunnel systems now. Forcing them out like rats from the drains. These, the Hamas are like coming out because you can't, you know, unless they have scuba gear down in those tunnels, they're not going to survive. They have these huge, I saw the pictures, the huge pumps and they're just pumping water into these elaborate maze of, of tunnels that Hamas made. You've seen it on TV probably already. Well, they are now aquariums. They're filling them up with salt water. Nobody can live in there. And so now they're getting in trouble for having all these Hamas people out. And when they get Hamas, they basically tear them down to their underwear. Be the reason being is because they have to make sure that they are not carrying any weapons. These are murderers. And so now the, the, the nations are complaining because they're humiliating these guys. And I think that if you were Hamas, you deserve to be humiliated after wow. what has happened. So they're treating them that way. And they're getting in a lot of trouble. If it, it could happen, that the nations could finally have enough, no, and all turn on Israel. I mean, we, this could happen tomorrow. We're very, very close to the potential of the biblical recipe for the return of Christ to happen. But I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to do purpose. I'm going to keep preparing messages. I'm going to keep preaching. 
If Jesus wants to come, let him come. If it's time, great. But what's going to be a big surprise to all these Jews who are waiting for Messiah to come is they're going to have to admit when he does come that, wait a minute, he's got holes in his hands and feet. That's the one we rejected. And they're going to, of course, it says, there's one prophecy, one of my favorites. It says all of Israel will be saved in a day. In one day. How can all of Israel, all the Jews, suddenly in one day believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're going to see him with their own eyes ripping open the eastern sky and coming down to the city, entering through the gate that is blocked up and cemented like that's going to stop Almighty God. He's going to crash through that wall, ta-da, and show them his holes in his hands and his feet, just like he offered Thomas when he doubted, and they are going to bow their knee. And then, oh, okay, you are the Messiah. And then he will give them that chance. Because that's how much God does love Israel. And God does want his people. And Paul wanted the same and often wrote about it. Back to this. The shepherds, they have this encounter. It changes them. And as this man is speaking to them and giving them this key, this is the, how are you going to know who the Messiah is? He's a baby and he's in a manger. You're going to find him like that. When you do, that's the one. Don't move on from there. That's the one. And so they listen. And it may have been a little difficult to believe one angel. Because as we've often learned, angels do not appear in great glory all the time. And at this point, this angel, just like Gabriel was with Mary, it looks like a guy. Because angels do not have wings. They just look like men. In fact, we, the Bible says we can entertain them unaware. You could be sitting next to an angel and not, you can be right, you could be on the MRT with an angel next to you. And I, I have had moments in my life where people just appeared out of nowhere to do exactly the thing that I needed in that moment. And I have to suspect that that very well could have been angels. The time we were stranded in the middle of a desert in Mexico and my vehicle ran out of gas and every gas station was empty and closed. If we went through three, my needle was below empty and we finally coasted and you could hear the engine going and we had just enough gravity to drift. This is in a desert to drift into this last gas station and it, like the engine was off and it just kind of rolled in front of the pump. And even then, they said, no, no gas. So we pushed the vehicle back over to a parking spot. And I turned to the students behind us in the cab of the truck. They were in the back bed. I said, students, we need to pray. You need to pray because we have no fuel. We've run out of fuel. We're in the middle of the desert. And there is no, and I'm saying, so we need to pray. Before I could finish the word, pray. Somebody's knocking on my door. And it's a man with a hose running behind him into a 55-gallon drum of gas in the back of his pickup truck, wow. saying, you need gas? <laughs> I don't know how that guy got there. I don't remember anyone even being parked next to me. Because I turned, I was in the vehicle, and I turned back to look at the students and say, because there's this little dividing window between the front of the truck and the back. I opened it and said, look, guys, we need to pray because there's no fuel. All the gas stations are closed, and we're stuck in the middle of the desert, and, and we need to prep. I spun around, and there's the guy with the thing. And the students that day, they, they knew they were able to see. See, that's a baby in a manger. A man with a hose. And it even had a pump on it, like he could pump it out of the tank. And then, of course, I said, man, I, charge, I was expecting him to charge me a lot of money for it. He charged me the going rate per liter of exactly what, what it would cost. God does amazing things. That's how you know his will. How do you know Jesus? Because he's the only baby laying in a manger in, in Bethlehem right now. He's the only one. You'll recognize Jesus. You'll find Jesus. That's what this message is really about. The shepherds, they have this encounter, but all of this is to bring them to Jesus. Everything that happens in our life is to bring us to that center that I was talking about. And uh, we, we have to imagine what they're going through. When suddenly, now what really proved it, if they didn't believe this one guy, a great company, basically a big choir of angels came praising God and saying, it doesn't say they were singing, it says praising. It doesn't necessarily mean singing, but I, I 
often just hear hallelujah, hallelujah, and with all the angels floating, hallelujah, hallelujah, and then they give the information. Then they're convinced. That's a pretty spectacular sight. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom, on whom his favor rests. So we see this. They had a supernatural encounter with God in the middle of nowhere. They are astounded. They're also uh, terrified. Terrified. It says, do not be afraid. Every time God shows up, the, the angel, that's the number one thing that an angel says is don't be afraid. Because they get afraid. And God is scary sometimes. God manifests this power to them to convince them and shock them. And this manifestation changed them forever. And they would never be the same. And they, need, they needed this encounter so they could be a vocal witness. They're being chosen. They're moving from shepherd to evangelists in one night. And this is how God turns ordinary people into extraordinary messengers of the gospel. God manifests his power. And this is what he did with Paul. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city. and You will be told what you must do. So in the story of Saul of Tarsus, we see the purpose of encounter. Why would God do this big manifestation of power and light? Because he needed to get this Saul guy to make a 180 degree turn in his opinion. And it wasn't going to be from simply speaking to people who believed in Jesus because he spoke to hundreds of them while he was arresting them. He heard every testimony from everyone. So God sometimes uses a, a, a hammer of manifestation in power. A bright light like this. And I have known people that have seen bright, I have seen light at times. I've had encounters with light. I've heard amazing stories of people who've had similar experiences to this that changed them forever. He uses the manifestation of his power and glory to alter the individual, to transform us. And this is what God did to me. This is what God still does to me. This is what God just did to me Thursday if you were in my house and I'm trying to worship and at the, I finished the worship and after that trying to just do the message. The glory of God absolutely consumed me. I thought I was going to die. The manifestation of God. The power of God. I love when He does it. I love when He gives me indubitable proof of Himself that goes beyond explanation. The supernatural presence of God. In these moments of glory, things happen inside of us at the speed of spirit, I call it. It's like, like the speed of light. You've heard of the speed of light, the speed of sound. But there is a speed of spirit which is faster than all, even faster than light. That when God does something, when he manifests his power like he did to me Thursday, there's things happening that do not fit in time. They are eternal things. He can do a, a million years of work in less than a second. Because he, at that moment you feel that manifestation, he has transitioned you out of time. You are now sharing realms. You're also coexisting in the eternities. And that's why the glory is sensed and the power comes through. There are things inside of you that, just like that, are changed. Information comes into you. Suddenly things you did not know, you know. Things you did not feel, you feel. And why would God do it? God does it always for exactly the same reason, the same as Paul on the road, for us to have the story to tell when we witness about him. The moments of glory. Things happen inside. This is also uh, why I, I always recommend and encourage God's people to seek such encounters. If you hear about people feeling God and experiencing God and having these encounters, uh, don't just watch the show and make sure that you tell God, God, I want that, I want that, I want whatever is happening to that person. I want whatever is stirred in that heart. I want whatever feeling Pastor Stephen is being tortured by right now, whatever that thing is that's consuming him, I want that too. Because that's exactly how I got it. I watched people experiencing the manifestation of the glory, and I literally just said, I don't want that. 
That's how it all started. I, I, I would like that. And then I started seeking and asked God, I want, I want a tangible reality of your presence that will cause me, when I speak about you, to speak with authority and fact, not with conjecture. And God, Jesus is Lord. It's not going to be a question. I think Jesus is Lord because I've met him and he's very lordy. He's very powerful. I know from experience. That's why we have these experiences. That's why these ordinary shepherds are being exposed to the eternal radiation of God's glory. And they're being cooked in it because they are going to need that energy to do what God is calling them to do. Just like we all need that energy. We need that anointing. Who I feel the anointing. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> we need that power, that energy. That that is that that is our story. That's the power of what we have. That's what the anointing breaks the yoke of ignorance and stupidity off of people's lives. We should, we should be begging him constantly for this. We should, we should, from the time we wake up to the time we go to sleep, we should be begging Almighty God to send a choir of angels to scream at us in the desert and tell us that there's a baby in a manger and he wants to use us to be able to announce it and he wants to, when we announce it, carry the glory of it to be able to take what he's put inside of us and let it flow out of us. Hmm. Suddenly a light from heaven flashes around us and we fall to the ground and we hear a voice. We hear God say, why do you fight against my purposes? Saul was a great guy. He was a great guy with, with, with trying to do great things, but they weren't God's purposes he was operating. So God uses the glory hammer sometimes. He smacks us over the head with it to wake us up. And things happen inside. That's why I recommend always seek, seek it. Seek it all the time. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You want him to take your veil away. Whatever it is that's standing between you and exposure to the power of eternity is represented by a veil. And if you turn to the Lord, the veil can be taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's freedom. The veil can be torn away for you. There's, you have a choice. You're free to choose to be anointed or not anointed. To have the power of God or not have the power of God. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. We're doing that right now. We're contemplating. He's taken the veil away. We have unveiled faces in this room right now. And if we take just a moment to contemplate, contemplate with our unveiled faces, the Lord's glory. Just think about His glory. Just think about His power. Think about His majesty, His energy. Think about the force that is in him and flows through him. We, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Ever-increasing. It means every time you have an encounter, it will be building upon the foundation of the last encounter. And it increases again and again and again. It gets bigger and bigger and greater and greater and stronger and stronger. And we're transformed by it. Ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit, it says. It comes from Jesus. It comes from the Holy Spirit. You will receive power after that. The Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witnesses, to be turned from an ordinary shepherd into a great evangelist. 
When we have these encounters, we, we experience God's glory. The third thing we have in common with these shepherds is the shepherds pursued God after having an encounter. In verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven. They're still in the wilderness, by the way. They're still, it was, it was not dark any longer, but when these angels left, it was dark again. There are moments you will encounter the glory of God and the light will be blinding, but then God will pull back because he needs you to respond to what he has deposited into you. At the speed of spirit, he's put something in you during that encounter, but then he withdraws from you and says, now what will you do with what you've received? And the shepherds said to one another, they're not stupid. They're no longer ordinary because they've had this experience. And they said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. If God said it, we got to see this. Let us go. Let's go. They have the synergy of their, their group together of these shepherds. They're knowing together. Man, we can't pass this opportunity up. God said if we go, we will see it. God said if we look for the, the manger with the baby in it, we will find the Messiah. I really want to meet the Messiah. Don't you want to meet the Messiah? And the shepherds looked at each other and said, yes, absolutely. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Did they go straight to that one barn? Did they go straight to that one place back behind the over-occupied hotel? Did they go straight to that spot? Was it the first one? Or did they go from barn to barn looking at empty mangers until they found a manger with a baby in it? We don't know. It doesn't say. I would like to think that they went through several barns and they didn't because when it comes to finding your connection to Jesus, it's not something you instantly find. It's like the pearl of great price. It's like the treasure hid in the field. It's something you have to really want. You have to really desire. You have to keep looking for it. And in your endeavor to find that treasure and find Messiah, find Jesus, you're going to have to look through a lot of barns where he is not. You're going to have to look at a lot of empty mangers. But the word is the word. He says you can be and you will find him. So you can't stop. You have to keep looking. If it takes you a thousand barns and a thousand mangers and every one of them is empty, don't stop because God said there will be a baby in a manger. So keep looking. Keep looking. Keep looking. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. They pursued God's presence after their initial encounter with the angels and received the promise of knowing Christ personally. They met Jesus. Little baby Jesus. They met Jesus. No, he was not glowing or floating. There was not a halo over his head. It's just he was the Messiah and they knew it, not because he was glowing, but because A, God said so, B, he's actually in a manger. The kid is in the manger. This is it. This is the one. And how perplexed Mary and Joseph are at this moment because these absolute strangers are barging into the barn and saying, do you have a baby in a manger? Oh, yes, we do. We actually do. Well, that's it. That's the one. They decided together in this passage to seek him. We, we see the, the corporate desire, the unity of the church. The church was built on this kind of unity. The church was built where two or more are gathered in his name. He will listen and wait for their agreement. And if they agree, if you agree with me that God can come and fill our space or our room or our service or our worship time or our prayer time, if you agree with me, because I know it as a fact and I've known it for many years now, very much knew it from, from the time I was 17 years old. I knew that if we seek him, we will find him and he will come. But you, when you get in agreement, you agree. Acts 2 1 says that the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. There's another translation of this because the word in the Greek means all together in one accord, in one place, in agreement. 
Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. So you see the recipe here. You see the ingredients needed for the mighty wind to blow. They were all together in one place, in agreement. What do you want for Christmas? What gift do you want? What better gift than the gift of the Holy Spirit? What better gift than the gift of the anointing? May the Lord give us of His Spirit for Christmas. May, may He give us the power of the baby that was in that manger. An encounter with the manifestation of God's glory. In other words, the encounter they had in the wilderness, the encounter they had, that's, that's not the end. It's a means to the end. This is important. An encounter with the power of God is not the end. It's not the, it's not the point. It's not the point. It's a means to the real end. To be connected to Jesus himself. They could have just stayed there and jumped around in the desert revival. And talked about the angels. And told everybody. But they didn't. They ran. They left where the encounter took place. And they went to find Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always manifest power in, upon, and through us with one goal in mind. And that's finding Jesus and finding his purpose. I saw a quote the other day from Catherine Coleman. It resonated with me. I liked it. She said that the Holy Spirit is the greatest promoter of man that has ever existed and he promotes only one man, Jesus. I said, did Jesus have an agent? Yes, the Holy Spirit. And all the Holy Spirit talks about is Jesus. All. The Holy Spirit is the center with Jesus in the center. The shepherds collectively decided in agreement to respond to this manifestation of glory and power by choosing to go and have an intimate connection with Jesus. They didn't stay in the wilderness. They went and found him. We need to find the baby in the manger. We need to find that direct connection, that intimacy with Jesus. They, I promise you they touched Jesus. I always imagine what it would be like to take my small finger and put it into little Jesus baby's hand and feel him just grip my finger. Knowing what the angel told me that this is the Messiah. This little baby is going to save everyone. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua is come. If we want to know the reason we celebrate Christmas. The Savior is born. Good news. Good news, the angels told me. We go to our final thing that we share with the shepherds. The shepherds testified about God. When they had seen him, it says. When they saw him. Go through the timeline of the shepherding ordinary people to uh, having an encounter with God that totally baffles and confuses them. And then the angels are all singing. They're overwhelmed and fearful from that and to, to pursuing what the angels said. They went and found Jesus. Now they had seen him. When they had seen him, now they have the intimacy and the connection with Jesus as a result of the encounter. What do they do? They spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. They went out and told everybody. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. All who heard it were amazed. They became not just shepherds, they became evangelists of what the truly the word evangelist, euagalesis, it means bearer of good news. They, they literally became the bearer of the good news because the angel said, I give you good news to you, a savior is born. 
You will find him. This is the sign you know which one. He's going to be wrapped in cloth. He's going to be in a manger, a baby in a manger. You got it? Baby in a manger. Find the baby in the manger. Okay. Ernie, if you don't believe me, hallelujah. And all the choir of angels come down, blows them away, the blinding light of heaven. They respond to that. They immediately go run, like looking for that treasure from barn to barn, from manger to manger until they find him. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning him, what had been told about this child, the information they carried from the angel, and then that interaction with Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus Messiah. Then they went out from that point and told everybody about it. Everybody. And how convincing they must have seemed to the people. You, could, you would see, I guarantee if you brought those shepherds in this room right now, bring them through time. Just, just minutes after they leave the, the barn, just minutes after they've seen the baby in the manger, and now they've got to tell somebody what just happened. Imagine how exciting their testimony would be. You would look in their eyes, you would see their face, and you would know these guys are telling the truth. And see, that's what God's power does. It authenticates our witness. We speak as those having authority. We're not conjecturing. We're not waiting around to meet God. We've met God. And we need to tell people about how great and wonderful and compassionate and kind and merciful and, and beautiful and wonderful and his presence is delicious his presence tastes like honey to me it tastes it's so sweet it's so sweet it's so sweet it's so sweet we must testify of what we've experienced the more real God is to us, the more real he will be through us. An encounter with God is the greatest gift of all. Thank you, Jesus, for it. The more we testify about the experiences we have with God, the more we experience God. In fact, the very testimony of the encounter stimulates and stirs up the power that we receive at that encounter. We dip back into that well of encounter. I guarantee you every single time the shepherds told the story of those angels and that choir in the middle of the wilderness, in the middle of the night, that they relived it. I imagine when they told the story from space to place, from synagogue to synagogue, from house to house, as they went telling everybody and everyone was amazed. Why were they amazed? It's, this is a stupid story. It's a crazy story if there was not some convincing presence with it. They would have been rejected, but it says no. Everybody that heard it was amazed. Why? Because it was anointed. Amen. It was oh. anointed. And that's where the power of our testimony lies. Let God touch you this Christmas. Meet the baby in the manger. Go, go hold his hand for a little while. Live that moment with the shepherds. He wants to prove himself to you. Just as he did to the shepherds. Ask him for the gift of his spirit. Ask him for an encounter. Ask him to find you in your ordinary state, in your ordinary place, doing your, what you do, feeding your animals or shepherding your flock or whatever you do, ask him to meet you out there where you are and to reveal his purpose and his plan to speak to you. And he will. Four things we share with the shepherds. The shepherds were ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary task, just like you. Every one of you in this room, I think you, I, I think you are spectacular. I think you are beautiful people, but honestly, we, we are all ordinary. We're just people living our lives. But God has an extraordinary thing for us, a great purpose he wants to manifest through us. 
They had an encounter with God. We have that similar with them. We have that. We have an encounter right here today. <laughs> had an encounter Thursday. Had an encounter today. You know what? I think I'm going to have an encounter tomorrow too. I'm going to keep having encounters. Next week I'm getting ready. I'm going to be able to preach in uh, the Church of Christ next Sunday. My friend Dave, Pastor Dave, has invited me there. And as you know, that's a bit of a rigid atmosphere. Uh, they know God's word. They love Jesus. It's not a question about that. But boy, they need the power of God. <laughs> I, I am not going in as a charismaniac. I'm not going to hoop and holler and jump. I'm going to. I'm going to conform to the protocols of their. Of the. I know it well because Dave is my, my best friend here in Singapore. And. Um, I'm going to speak, but I'm, in my heart of hearts, my prayer is that the glory of God would sneak into that church. That heaven manifest. That they feel the dew of heaven dripping on them. And that those people in their ordinary lives would meet the Messiah. Yes, they know Jesus is Savior, but know the power. Praying that God will use me to bring that. And I think it will. Please agree with me in prayer. That next week, next Sunday, the, the Mome Church of Christ will experience the gift, the real gift of Christmas, the real gift given to us. The presence and the power of God. The reality of Jesus in spirit. All of you are invited to come, by the way. I'll publish the exact service time and everything. Wouldn't wouldn't hurt to have some Holy Ghost people like you mixed in the crowd. <laughs> like a virus. Just let you contaminate them out there. You're all welcome, but not Patricia. <laughs> I don't know if they're ready. I don't know if they're ready for you, Patricia. Third, we saw the, she the shepherds pursued God after having an encounter. Yeah, we have encountered, but the, this is just, this is the means to the end. The end is Jesus, touching Jesus, walking with Jesus, and telling the story that you've seen Jesus. And it will resonate and it, it will pour through you as power as we testify. Testify about God. Jesus. Why don't we stand to our feet? Thank you, Jesus. Come.
would bless the food that we consume and be sanctified by the word of our prayer. You bless our bread, you bless our water, you take sickness out of our midst and we're thankful for it. Even during Christmas, we can remember what took place that Thursday before the crucifixion day. You took the bread and you broke it and you gave it to your disciples and you said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. As we share our food together tonight, Lord, we remember that your body was broken for us on the cross at Calvary. That the purpose of you being born for you coming and being a baby in a manger was to die on that cross. And may that sacrifice not be in vain. Let it be what sanctifies us. We receive your body tonight. We remember it tonight. That same night you took the cup and you said, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, remember. We remember it tonight, Lord. We remember the sacrifice of your blood that was poured out for us all. Let that blood be upon us. Let it be upon our families. Let it be upon our homes. Let it be upon our businesses. On everything we do. Lord, let that blood be smeared over our doorposts so that the angel of death will pass over us. We believe this and we accept it. Thank you for it all, Lord. We love you. We magnify you tonight, Lord. Thank you for coming and being with us here tonight. For your purposes being fulfilled in us. Lord, let us be like the shepherds. We're ordinary people, but we have an extraordinary purpose in your kingdom. Use us for your glory, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We are moving toward our Christmas meeting. Fowler, you have something to share? Please do. Okay, um, okay. Okay, so this is regarding the Christmas outreach. Um, the Lord was just now the Lord was saying, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So, in line with what Stephen was saying, I thought that the message is very good because it's in line with what the Lord is in, in line with what we're going to do. So, let's be the shepherd this Christmas. Yeah, let's go and bring people so that they can hear the good news. And they come here and you know, hear the testimonies and not just having fun and getting prizes but you can hear the testimonies and sharing mm. um, the message so let's do that um, and the Lord was giving me the ideas um, I think yesterday the ideas just kept coming in so you know I just wrote them down um, so basically uh, for this Christmas outreach Christmas is on the 23rd of December this month right uh, if, for those of you you can see on Facebook the, the banner, the information has been given out. And uh, I would probably print out a small brochure so that we can take it out on the streets to give it to people. Okay, so on the 23rd of December, uh, uh, we will probably meet about 350-350 at Funan, outside Funan Centre. Uh, and then we can go together with the brochure. And on the brochure, there will be, of course, the menu and the direction to Bible House, and then there will be a gift code. So with that gift code, they can come bring the gift, the, the brochure with the code, and come and redeem 